Hey guys, about a year ago, a little over a year ago, we took a look at Henry Whitaker's speed test Docker container that allowed us to automatically run speed tests just to make sure that our ISP was providing the service that they said that they were providing. And I loved everything about it, except that about a year ago, shortly after uh, we took a look at that container, uh, it stopped being maintained. So it hasn't been updated in about a year. And unfortunately, we don't like to keep those kind of containers on our Docker server whenever we can help it. Uh, luckily, another team has taken over and kind of uh, replaced that with a much better solution. So this is Alex Justison's speed test Docker container that allows us again to uh, periodically on schedule run t uh, tests to make sure we're getting what our ISP has promised. And he's actually got a team of uh, four contributors. It looks like Alex and a couple of uh, three others who are working on this. This is still in alpha. So please keep that in mind. This is still in alpha. However, if you'd like to help them contribute to them, whatever, uh, there is a GitHub link in the description down below where you can go over and contribute or, or help them financially or however you want to help. Definitely check that out. But the bare minimum that I would hope you would do is at least go give that, that, that GitHub repository a star just to let them know that you're interested in their project. So all of that said, in this video, we're gonna take a look at how to get this new speed test Docker container installed on, well, Docker, as you would expect. So before we get into that though, I do have some bills to pay. So here's a quick message from today's video sponsor. I start the day with my favorite drink, a cup of coffee. I love the smell, the boost it gives me, and the way it tastes. I love everything about coffee. Well, almost. You see, the problem I have with coffee is that I get a big spike of energy, but then by the middle of the day, the spike turns into a crash and I'm ready for a nap. That changes though, when I take a shot of Magic Mind after I've had my morning coffee. I don't get the spike, I don't get the crash. I get a steady pick-me-up that helps me maintain much longer than just a cup of coffee. It does what it says on the bottle. The matcha gives me energy, the nootropics help me maintain focus, and believe it or not, having more energy and more focus and not feeling like garbage actually improves my mood. It's also got a healthy dose of vitamin C to help with your immune system, which is especially important heading into the colder months. I also really dig this sweet, earthy taste of Magic Mind, and it really does help me get through the day, honestly, more than I ever thought it would. So if you'd like to get some Magic Mind of your own to give it a shot, pun intended, uh, be sure to click the link in the video description down below. So just taking a quick look at the GitHub repository here, there's a lot of information here. Uh, we can see that this has been updated as recently as yesterday. I absolutely love seeing super recent development uh, so that we know that it really is being worked on, it's being updated, it's being maintained, it's being developed. I love to see that in here and you can always check out their GitHub repository if you want to do that. What I also love about this page is right up here on the top right, there is a documentation website where we can go over here and get an idea of what's going on. Uh, here, of course, is the introduction, and we've kind of already introduced this, so we're gonna skip that. But if we come over here to getting started and go to installation, uh, here, of course, is a screenshot. Uh, and if we come over and actually, let's take a quick look at my installation here, which looks just like this, uh, we can see our most recent uh, download, upload, and pings. Uh, so I love seeing that. Now, this currently at this time, does not have uh, the fancy charts that, or the fancy graphs that uh, the Henry Whitaker's solution has, but I do know that they are working on that, that is planned. But if we come back over to here, uh, we can get an idea of uh, the required configurations, installing with Docker, uh, whether you're using a SQLite database, a Maria database, or MySQL, of course, is, is tied into that, as well as a, a PostgreSQL database, if you wanted to use that. Now, this is just installing with Docker, uh, like CLI command lines, stuff. So you would need to separately install those databases where applicable, um, and it wouldn't actually have anything to do with these commands here. However, uh, I love that they were forward thinking enough to give us some Docker Compose stuff again with uh, SQLite. If you just wanted to run a SQLite database, uh, you could also run a uh, Maria database slash MySQL. Again, that's the one we're going to take a look at in this video. But there's also a Postgres SQL database if you wanted to run that way. And this actually both both of these Docker Composes do actually include uh, the, the database image and the configuration for that. So uh, they've also got uh, an Unraid thing that they're working on as well. Uh, we can take a look at the features over here. Again, all of these links will be in the description down below. So again, another screenshot here. Uh, it looks like they've got x86 and ARM64 completed. They've got an Unraid community uh, app completed and they are working on a bare metal solution as well. 
so they're on their dashboard, they're showing most recent results. We saw that already. Uh, pretty graphs, like we talked about a minute ago, they are working on that, that is planned. And of course, they've also got a history of results. That's kind of what the database is for. And of course, below that, they've got a, a speed test options. Uh, they've got ping options uh, for ping domain of a, or a list of domains. Uh, again, they've got SQLite, Maria, Postgres, Influx, lots of stuff in here. I definitely encourage you to come check this out, um, but I don't wanna waste too much of your time. We wanna get through this uh, relatively quickly here. So uh, let's just, just real quick, uh, they do have authentication. We do wanna be aware of that. Uh, so when you first deploy this, you're gonna be brought to, uh, to a login screen and right here on the authentication page is the username and password that you'll need. You can, however, if you want to turn the authentication off and we will take a look at that once we get this set up. So let's head back over to the installation container or the installation page here so we can deploy the container. Uh, we're gonna scroll down, we're gonna grab this Maria database MySQL uh, thing going on here. And I'm just gonna copy this just by clicking the little copy button right over there. And then I'm gonna open a new tab. I'm gonna go 192.168.1.75 and we're gonna go to port 9 thousand on that. That's where I have Portainer. So be sure to enter your IP address and your uh, Portainer port. I'm sure it's probably 9,000, but enter your information here. Click enter. We're going to go ahead and get logged in. And then we're going to go ahead and open this up. Our container, we've just got Portainer running here. So let's head over to stacks. We're going to click on add a stack. We're just going to paste this in real quick. And then I'm just going to copy this and paste that in. Uh, just that we've got uh, a name for our stack here. So up, let's let's actually take a look at this stack now. Uh, it is a version 3.3 uh, stack or Docker Compose. You can kind of think about those terms being interchangeable. Below that, we've got some services. Our first service is Speed Test Tracker with a container name of, well, Speed Test Tracker. Uh, we've got ports 8443 uh, mapped over to 443, which means this does have an SSL built into it. And that's gonna play a little bit of a role in, in a couple of different places. First, when we deploy it and try to access it from Portainer initially. We're going to show it, we're going to throw an error and I'm going to show you how to fix that. Super easy. But if you wanted to put this behind a reverse proxy, uh, you would want to keep in mind that this does have that, uh, that, uh, that SSL built into it and you'd have to accommodate that in your reverse proxy. So next we've got some environment variables. We've got a PUID and a PGID. Um, for my setup, I'm going to leave these as 1000. However, uh, if you need to change that, I believe if we come over to here, uh, and we come over to here, it actually tells you how to find that. You would just SSH into your server, uh, and then and then once you're logged in, you would just do ID space, and then your username. Now, 1000 is probably fine. If you're using something like a Synology, uh, that would be definitely different. Uh, if you're logging in as root, and it throws a zero, zero for PUIG and PGID, don't use zero, zero, just leave it as a thousand. You should be fine. Um, just just try to never run anything as root. It's super, super dangerous as far as permissions are concerned, uh, unless you explicitly trust that container. But again, it's still bad practice to run anything as root. So if we come back over to our uh, portainer, I've got multiple portainers open here. Um, <clears throat> So below that, we've got a database connection. We're gonna use a MySQL database connection. The database host is showed as DB. That's actually declared right down here. That's how we're getting that name. That's where we're getting that from. Um, and we're actually gonna see that down here where it says it depends on DB. If for whatever reason you shouldn't need to, but if for whatever reason you need to change any of that, if you change DB here, change it here and uh, here as well, but you probably shouldn't change it. You probably don't need to. Um, uh, below that, we've got a database port. 3306 is a very standard MySQL database port, so don't mess with that. Um, and then below that, you've got a database a name, a username, and a password. If you change these, be sure to come down in the database container and change them appropriately as well. Um, again, we've got a volume uh, for for our uh, speed test tracker uh, container here. I'm going to change this. Uh, I'm going to put this where I pu always put this stuff. I'm just going to be home slash home slash docker slash speed test. Good enough for me. Uh, and then we're mapping that to the config folder inside the container. So the left side is where it is actually on the physical machine or the virtual machine you're running. And then uh, the right side of that is in the container itself. The image we're running is from a GitHub repository. Again, this Alex Justison speed, speed test tracker. We're gonna pull the latest version. Now keep in mind, this is still technically an alpha. So things may change and you need to be aware of that if you're going to deploy this container on your system. 
Um, <clears throat> again, we talked about this depends on basically um, this, this lines 19 and 20 here, uh, basically tell the speed test tracker container to wait for the database to come up before it actually tries to do anything. It needs that database in order to, to pull and store data. So that's what it depends on there is for. Below that, of course, our next service, we talked about services right up here. Our first one was Speed Test Tracker. Our second one is the database. We are using the Maria database version 10 for this. Uh, that's the one that they have made sure that it works with. We've got a restart policy on this of always, basically meaning that uh, if, you're, if something goes wrong, if your server reboots, whatever, it will automatically come back up. That's all that's there for. Below that, we've got, again, our Maria database uh, name, user, password. Uh, so again, if you change any of these, make sure you change them in both locations. And then below that, we've got uh, just saying, hey, for the root password, just make it something random so that we can't access it at root. We don't want to access this as root. So just uh, go ahead and leave that alone. We've got a volume of speed test database, uh, just where are we going to store this uh, database information? This is going to be in a Docker volume versus a mounted path uh, like we did up above. You could probably mix and match those however you wanted to, but this is just the standard way that they've got this set up. And of course, this volume is mapped to varlib MySQL, just as it would be for any other MySQL database. And because we're using this Docker volume here, we need to declare it down there. And that's it. That's all there is to this Docker container as far as getting it up and running. So uh, let's go ahead and click on deploy the stack. We're going to give this a minute to do its thing. Um, and once it's done, we'll come back and take a look. So here we are just a couple of moments later, and we can see that speed test tracker is up and running. We're going to go ahead and open that up and we can see that our published ports are there. Uh, we've got, uh, let's take a look at our database here. It is uh, ready for connections. So that's good to go. Glad to see that. Uh, next, we're going to take a look at the uh, the container logs for speed test tracker, and it says that it is up and working. It is starting the queue worker, so that looks good as well. So, let's go ahead and just click right here. Oh. So this is a new server. Uh, so I actually forgot to do something here. I need to come over. If you get this zero, zero, zero thing in the address bar up here, uh, I've talked about this a bunch, but you may, maybe you haven't watched all my videos, whatever. We're gonna come over here to environments. We're gonna go to local and right here where it says public IP. We're gonna go ahead and type in our IP address of our server. So for me, it's gonna be 192.168.1.75 and we're gonna click update. Now, if we come back to our containers, we see a speed test tracker and we click this. Um, it's still throwing an error. This is a 400 saying that we're trying to pull a secure uh, URL on a non-secure uh, URL, right? So what we're gonna do is just come up to here. We're gonna do HTTPS at the beginning of that and hit enter. Your connection isn't private. It is a self-signed certificate. So that's why we're seeing this error message. But what we're gonna do is click advanced. We're gonna go to ahead and proceed to that. It says it's unsafe. It's fine. Our email address for this will be admin at example com and then password. Again, if you're not sure, you don't remember whatever, you can come back over here and see that right here. So we're gonna come back over, we're gonna get logged in, we're gonna click sign in. I say no, oops, don't save that. So uh, if you caught that little blip there, uh, the first thing I like to do is come over here and click toggle dark mode because I prefer dark mode for everything. Uh, here we can see that we've got a dashboard, uh, our latest download, our latest download, our latest upload and our latest ping. None of those are there because it just came up. We haven't run anything yet. We're just gonna go ahead and click on Q. What this is gonna do is allow us to manually run a, uh, a speed test, right? It's just that easy. Um, and then if we refresh, give it a second here. Nope, nothing yet. So it's still running in the background and that's fine. While it's doing that though, let's go take a look at a few other things here. So what we'll do is we'll click over here on results. Um, and there we go. Uh, this download sucks. I'm fixing that. There's actually videos coming up about a new upgrade to my network that I'm getting. So uh, we've got, uh, this says scheduled with an X in it. It means we manually ran that. Uh, if it was a scheduled, which will run about once an hour by default, um, and, and at the top of the hour, if I'm being honest, uh, it, those will show a green check mark versus a red X here. Shows our download, our upload, our ping, our server ID, uh, where it was, created on so when that was uh, just a minute ago. Uh, that is the wrong time because we haven't set our time zone just yet, but I'll show you how to do that. And if we want to, we can click view on speedtest.net and there are our results for that. So kind of cool. I dig that it's got that option there. Um, come over to general settings. Right here, we can change the, the title that shows up in the in the, uh, in the browser window, up in the tabs there. Uh, for this, I'm gonna type in Denver, like so, and it's just that easy to change your time zone. I dig that. 
Um, <clears throat> below that, we, or next to that, we can change the time format if you wanted to do that for whatever reason. Uh, we can say with this cron job setup, I love that this is in here, um, that we can just say, when do we want to run a cron job? Uh, this is at the top of every hour of every day of every week of every month of every year, basically. And then if we wanted to, we could pick a specific server ID and put that in there uh, if you wanted to go that route, or you can just let the system pick for itself. So up here at the top right is that authentication enabled check mark or, or toggle switch there. If you just want to jump in here, do your thing and jump out, you can turn this off. However, if you're gonna put this on a public facing URL, uh, I would probably leave this enabled. So pick and choose that, that that fits your settings the best. We'll click save. We come over here to notifications. Uh, we can actually enable database notifications. Um, they are currently working on other notifications, but for right now, it will just, um, it, if it meets certain thresholds, whether it's, you know, notify for every speed test run, which would be 24 notifications a day, or if you hit certain threshold failures, meaning your your ping is too high, your upload or your download is too low, um, you can get notifications that way. And what it will do is just throw a little notification up here on the top right hand side where that bell is next to the A. Um, and then you can test that if you want to. Uh, I'm not going to enable it, but you absolutely can if you want to. In fact, let's, let's actually do this. Um, Nope, I am wrong. We're gonna we're not gonna worry about that. There's an influx DB option here as well. If we want to go that route, uh, I'm not going to. I don't know why we would, but we can also go to this thresholds tab here, and uh, enable absolute thresholds. And if our we can set kind of the low end of our upload and download and the high end of our ping. And with that, if if we turn on the threshold notifications from uh, the other tab, we'll get those notifications appropriately. So I'm not gonna do any of that. Uh, again, we've got the option for documentation, donate and source code. Again, if you dig this project, please go give them a star. If you wanna help that support them financially, you can donate there as well, I believe. So that's basically it as far as that is concerned. Um, it doesn't look like for whatever reason that we can change our username and password. I have mixed feelings on that. So maybe, maybe while this is still an alpha, don't put this on a public facing URL just for um, just for security reasons. Um, but if we come back to the dashboard, I'll give that a second. There's our latest download and our latest upload. Also, I just wanna bring this up. I brought it up a few times in the past and it seems like you guys are fairly receptive to, if you guys want to help the channel financially and actually get something back in return, um, if you go over to Patreon or dbtech.fans or become a channel member, We'll talk about that one a little bit different, but if you go over to, to, to Patreon or dbtech.fans, you can get access to my content with no ads. That's no baked in ads. That's no YouTube ads, no ads whatsoever, just down to the nitty gritty. For as little as a dollar a month, you can get access to all of my content that's available with no ads. And that's basically everything I put out for the past several months. So if you're interested in that, dbtech.fans, patreon.com, um, for a dollar a month, you can get access to my content with no ads. Or you can become a channel member uh, for a few bucks a month. It's a little different because YouTube charges exorbitant rates uh, to have memberships. So if you want to support, cool. If not, uh, ads it is. So with that said, though, I do want to thank you for spending a few minutes of your day with me today. I'm going to wrap this up and I will talk to you guys in the next video.